Good evening. The Darfur region of Sudan is again embroiled in violence as horse riding Arab militias known as Janjaweed and the Sudanese government sponsored paramilitary force, the RSF, invaded towns and villages on Friday and set them ablaze. Thousands of people are without homes and hundreds have been killed. According to the BBC and other international media organizations, the latest conflict started in Krenik, 80 kilometer east of Jenea, following a dispute between Arab Normans and members of the Masalit community. For decades, the two groups have, chased, uh, have clashed over land, with Krenik as the home of the people driven from their rural villages by Janja weed raids. The Darfur conflict started in 2003 and was once a cause of global outrage. International peacekeepers were deployed and an international arrest warrant was issued for Janjaweed's former leader, Ali Mohammed Ali Rahman, also known as Ali Kashua, and Sudan's ousted president, Omar al-Bashir. The conflict has left over 300,000 people dead and more than 2 million others homeless. The Janjaweed accused of ethnic cleansing in Darfur have been reasserting their dominance and imposing their will following the end of the peacekeeping mission in 2020. Some observers also suggest that the renewed attacks aim to destroy the displaced people's camp, which is strong evidence of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and a crime against humanity, parts of the charges in the ongoing trial of the former Janjaweed leader. The four region is rich in gold, and political observers have accused Janjaweed of attempting to gain control of the land for gold prospecting. They do this by recruiting Arab fighters from Chad and other Sahel countries and encouraging the fighters to bring their families to populate cleared out areas of Darfur. Today is May 1, 2022. It's Labor Day across most of Africa. In Ghana, the new government imposed levy of 1.5% tax on all electronic transactions above 100 Ghanaian CD, which is about 13 US dollars, takes effect. Known as the e-levy, it's a source of concern for Ghanaian merchants and customers alike. The e-levy, another Ghanaian government's efforts to raise revenue, will apply to bank transfers, remittances, and other mobile money transactions. During a parliamentary debate last year, lawmakers who opposed the law for its expected impact on small businesses and low-income workers exchanged punches with those in support. In anticipation of the new law coming into effect, Ghanaian banking regulators have noticed a reduction in the use of mobile banking in the West African countries, as Ghanaians who can pay the levy gradually return to the use of cash in their business transaction. I am Chido Anuma. It's 8.30 a.m. in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I am Rudolph Okonkwo. It is 11.30 a.m. in New York City. Uh, it is 4.30 p.m. in Nigeria. It is 5.30 p.m. in Sudan. Wherever in the world you are joining us, welcome to another edition of 90 Minutes Africa. On our show today, we have three of Nigeria's celebrated journalists. They will examine the role of the media in the 2023 elections and the crisis facing the media in Nigeria. Joining us from Lagos, Nigeria, is Kadera Ahmed, the CEO of Radio Now, 95.3 FM, and from London, is Simon Kola Wale, the publisher of The Cable. And from Abuja, Nigeria, is Azu Ishekwene, the editor-in-chief of Leadership Newspaper. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Let's see. Let's Ladies bring... and gentlemen, you're welcome to the oh, show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, all right. Let me start with you, ladies, first. So, uh, Kadera, uh, let me come to you first. I know that you have a series that you're running um, across Nigeria. It's called the Open Square, where you give opportunities for constituencies to meet their lawmakers. And I think it's a very unique thing in Nigerian uh, media. Uh, how is it going? And what is your, what have you learned in that uh, experience in terms of um, the encounter between the lawmakers and the people who they represent? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Okonko. Um, first, for the invitation, um, for the opportunity to be part of um, sitting down and having this conversation. Uh, Chido, thank you as well. And of course, hello, Simon and um, Azu. 
Um, the series um, have um, been really well received by constituents. Um, the turnout, um, when we sort of, um, we're doing them regionally. So we're doing six. So far, we've done four. We started out in the southwest. We did one in Ibadan. We did another one in the southeast in Nigeria. Um, we did one in the northeast in Gombe. Um, and for the north central, that took place just this past Saturday in um, Abuja. And the turnout in terms of just the constituencies, people are very eager for those kind of platforms. They want an opportunity to engage with the people who are supposed to be at the center representing them. What we hear again and again is that um, we see these people only during election circles. After elections, they disappear. And even the numbers they give us, some of them don't work. So we're not able to reach them. Um, but we also found out, and I think we kind of knew this was the case, which is why we sort of decided to create this series and put it out there, especially in the run-up to elections, that there's a big misunderstanding among um, constituents about the role that the National Assembly is supposed to be playing in our democracy. Partly um, because people don't understand, but partly, as has come out again and again throughout the town halls, is partly legislators themselves misleading people and making outlandish promises in trying to get into office and, and, and saying to people, we're going to do this for you, we're going to do this for you, things that are not part of their constitutional duty. And then after elections, people have these expectations, or oh, you're supposed to be bringing roads to us, you're supposed to be bringing hospitals. And you know the, the role of the National Assembly is, of course, lawmakers, is they're supposed to also sort of provide a check and balance and an oversight function as well when it comes to the executive. But um, overall, it's been well received. I think the most disappointing part of it is that the turnout from the National Assembly hasn't been as great as it would be. The, the senators and the House of Assembly members that are actually attending are people that when you actually see their record, you see that they're actually doing well as representatives. But those that are doing badly, who ironically, I suspect many constituencies we're hoping they would see and confront and hold accountable are the ones that are also not accepting the, the invitation to actually take part in this conversation. But we think it's a good start. And um, all the feedback we've received from people who've attended, people who've watched us, because we're doing this in partnership with channels. So it's going out both on YouTube, our radio station, but also channels TV. The feedback has been very positive and people have said, can we do this more often? Very good, very good. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, you can go next. Yeah, okay. So uh, taking up from where you stopped, and I would like Simon and Azu to respond to it, this, but before we come back to you, Kaderia, the, the media is an enabler of democracy, which essentially is what you're doing with your current program. Uh, how, when you have a largely illiterate population, how do you make meaning of the role of this specific role of the media? Is, is there a big gap in terms of an understanding of what the media is doing and how citizens can uh, take it and run with it for want of a better word? Let's start with Azu, then um, Simon and then Kaderia. Yeah. All right, uh, so thank you very much once again um, for having me on this uh, 90 Minutes Africa. It's a great pleasure, um, Rudolf, Chido and uh, my colleagues, uh, Kaderia and, um, and Simon. Uh, so the comment that you made, uh, Chido, about the people being largely illiterate, I'm sure that um, I, I don't know how many, I don't know how many people out there have shared with us the uh, adventurous experience she's having on, on her platform, getting, um, getting, um, politicians to uh, to come and share a space and be accountable and be held accountable by people that elected them. Now, when they are seeking for political offices, I'm sure that they do not think that these people are illiterate and no good. But when it comes to time for them to account, then we begin to ask ourselves whether these people are literate or, or illiterate. So I, I do not think that that uh, speaks to the point. I think essentially that People who um, offer themselves for service um, do have a responsibility, in my view, uh, to be accountable to the people that, uh, that uh, have appointed them or elected them into office. 
Uh, and in terms of what the media can do in facilitating this uh, sort of role, uh, I think that Kadoria has done well in doing that. I, I think that the media also has to go beyond, um, uh, you know, the more conventional uh, spaces like what, what we have in um, what we have in, in big cities, and because the, the large populations of uh, voting publics and Nigerians to whom these people are accountable, that are incidentally outside the reach of conventional media. So I, I think that it's also our responsibility why we do the bits we can and offer little sense by using traditional mainstream media. I think we also have to go beyond that uh, to see how we can invite uh, people in the more remote areas to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Uh, Simon, your take. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me on your program. Uh, I must say that this is a wonderful thing you are doing. I've been following it, and uh, please uh, keep keep it going, keep it up. Thank you. I feel very encouraged about the conversations. Um, thank you again for having me on the program, and uh, due regards to my colleagues, my senior colleagues here. Um, in addition to what uh, uh, Mr. Ishikwene has said, I think, in a way, the people who are uneducated, quote-unquote, are also being reached through other means. We have vernacular programs on radio. People have access on TV, even in rural areas. Um, and also, increasingly, you'll be surprised at how internet is penetrating uh, even remote, remote places. I went for my grandmother's barrier, and I was surprised that the people were using the social media, even in my village. So. These are the platforms and channels by which the media should continue to uh, hold these people accountable. And also, we, 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 we send reporters to these villages, to remote areas, and they tell us what they are experiencing, the, their challenges, uh, water, uh, healthcare, and all that. And we, we put them on, uh, on what we call the traditional, the mainstream media. So, the, I, I think we are making progress in that aspect, and we can do more in terms of creating that connect in uh, information management. Yeah, so before you answer, Kaderia, specifically mm -hmm. based on your own experience, and I know before now you've done tremendous work relating uh, whether it's uh, the town hall meetings you had many years ago and some other programs. Do you feel mm -hmm. There is a sense in which your audience, the public, are in tune with the media language, what the media is doing, that they understand and appreciate the work of the media. So, I mean, let me speak specifically to this town hall and how we tried to make sure that it was inclusive and then sort of take the wider question of whether the general media is uh, understood clearly. So with this town hall, for example, we took the trouble to ensure as much as we could to take the conversations outside um, what you might call the usual suspected suspect cities that these conversations take place. So traditionally, conversations would have taken place in a place like Lagos. We took the trouble and took the conversation instead to Ibadan because we wanted people from Ekiti, from Oshun, to come. And what we did is that we made sure that we also found enough resources to be able to actually pay transportation for people who were traveling out of state. Um, in some cases, even provide accommodation for those who couldn't go back home and a lot of feeding. We also ensured that our, our moderators spoke whatever the dominant language of that region was. And that proved very useful because um, the town hall we had in Ibadan, for example, you had constituents who were more comfortable asking questions in Yoruba as opposed to asking questions in English. And because the person who was moderating that conversation was Yoruba, what she did was that she would listen to the question, then translate it into English, and then have the um, senators in this case, because this, some of these questions were directed to specific senators to respond. And we were able to um, get them a response, both in English and also in Yoruba. It did, I mean, that there were concerns regarding time, because you know when you do televised shows, um, you're very limited in terms of time. But what, what we found is that if we were really to have the sort of impact that we wanted to have, it was important that you allowed people to articulate what they were trying to discuss in languages that are sort of specific to them and are, are comfortable with them. And I think this is perhaps 
um, part of the reason why radio in many parts of Nigeria continues to be relevant. Certainly in the north, um, it continues to be a medium that is used very, very effectively, even by politicians, especially during campaign season. So there's a lot of radio stations broadcasting in local languages. In terms of whether we are um, in touch, I think <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there's a lot of distrust of traditional media in Nigeria. Um, a lot of people you talk to will tell you um, they believe that we are somewhat in collusion with um, people in positions of authority. Sometimes they find it very difficult to differentiate between us and the people we're supposed to be holding accountable. And if we're being honest, partly it's our fault. We've lost the, the trust of the media. And so a lot of them now rely on sort of social media. And you know how problematic that is in terms of just the authenticity of that information. And so the responsibility and the onus really is on us to regain trust and to also begin to find the right kind of language to be able to speak to the rank and file of regular Nigerians who do not have access to power and who may not necessarily have the affluence of data and all of that, although like Simon pointed out, it's getting um, cheaper and cheaper. And, and there are initiatives that are taking place that um, both you know, Azu and Simon have been part of and we've made a bit of progress. And I'm sure before the end of this conversation, one of us will have an opportunity to perhaps discuss what we're trying to do to regain uh, public interest, public trust in terms of the um, um, tra traditional media and, and, and the work that we are doing. But um, I honestly believe journalism in particular, and I think sometimes we use that word interchangeably, and there's actually a difference, you know, because within media, you have, you know, all sorts of media, the, you know, content isn't necessarily journalism. Um, but journalism, I think the more um, democratized information has become, the more freely available it has become, I think the more significant the work of actual journalists, whose sort of main reason for being is holding power accountable and setting agendas for conversation. The more problematic a country is, the more important the role that journalists play. And that's why I think we've all sort of taken the challenge seriously of trying to sort of regain trust and ensure that we're able to carry out this constitutionally protected role. And um, we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, a little bit later about what exactly it is that we are doing as a, as a, as a um, sector, because we have made some progress. Mm. All right. Thank you very much. Talking about constitutionally protected uh, role, we are in an election year. I mean, election is next year, which is a year away. There is so much expectation from the media. Uh, the media is a provider of information which is necessary to sustain any democracy. Let's start with Simon. Uh, you, you are a journalist. You've been one for almost three decades, but also you are a media manager. What, in your expect, uh, estimation, how prepared do you think the media is? And uh, when I talk of media, I'm generalizing whether print, electronic, social media. Uh, how prepared are we for the task ahead vis a vis 2023? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it was very difficult to speak for the entire media on how prepared they are. Um, but I know of specific, of specific media organizations that are getting ready and are already doing something ahead of the elections. Uh, on our own part, for instance, uh, we are going to launch a, 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 a subdomain soon where we are going to be tracking facts around the elections, what we call fact checks. Now, because what we have seen from the election of 2015 and that of 2019 is that fake news is going to continue to multiply. And this is going to cause a lot of problems that we may not be able to handle. So we are seeing a situation where the media will be more alive to its responsibility of information dissemination so that people, when they see things flying around on, uh, on uh, social media, they can go to the trusted media uh, news sources to find out if those things are true or not. Now, so I see the media increasingly, because if you look around, a lot are getting uh, developing uh, tools and uh, de devoting spaces to fact-checking claims that are coming out around this election. And fake news, especially, 
uh, I saw one recently where Obasanjo was quoted as saying it was Atiku that told him to cede Bakasi to Cameroon. He didn't know Atiku was trying to protect his fatherland. <laughs> now, a lot of this will happen, but on the hourly basis. So the media, I'm seeing even what we call the traditional newspapers, they are also devoting more time to cross-checking this these things. So that is, for me, part of preparation for the election. Uh, two, certain agenda. The, the agenda currently is not being properly set. We have a lot of issues in Nigeria. We have a lot of issues. We are dealing with ASU strike that has been there right from, I've been hearing of ASU strike only God knows how many years. We are not discussing how can we address this issue once and for all. We are not discussing issues around debt. We are heavily indebted. We are spending almost the entire revenue we are getting on servicing debt. We are not discussing issues around this. So for me, these are part of the expectations for the media ahead of the lectures. Let's discuss issues. Yes, there are issues about rotation and ethnicity. Those are also issues. I mean, if you don't have a settled policy, you continue to run uh, elder skelter, you know, in terms of your uh, uh, the way you go about uh, addressing these issues. But let's discuss all issues together. Don't let us just focus on rotation, rotation, uh, this person, this person, or not that person. And the issues that affect the ordinary well, Nigeria. Not, 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 to cut, not, not to cut you, before Azu comes in, Simon, you say, let's not. How, so, how do we do this? They mean, you are in control. Who yes. determines how we go about uh, this conversation? Very important question. When we talk of independence of the media, we assume that if a media organization is not owned by the government, then it is independent. It's not true. The ownership structure of the media, too, is an issue. So um, if you look at the history of Nigerian media generally, it was the nationalists and the politicians that set up all the newspapers. And it seemed to have followed that pattern. So a lot of newspapers have loyalties to politicians, if they are not even owned by the politicians. So the kind of agenda they are going to set in their own set of it's going to be different from the one that is completely detached from any political affiliation and and uh, or or any ethnic uh, uh, any ethnic loyalty. So that's why I say I cannot speak for the entire media, but I know some uh, media organizations that are determined to push these issues forward. And as the we are getting closer and closer to the you can see the the pattern of stories, the pattern of, pattern of questions, the pattern of issues they are raising as we get closer to the elections. Mm. Okay. So, so, can, uh, can I just say something quickly before yeah. we leave this matter? I know you want to speak to Azu. So if anybody is interested, this evening at um, 9.30, I'm having on my program, Pivotal, I'm having a very extensive conversation with um, Mr. Okweyemi Akbaje, who is one of our leading economists, exactly on this issue of debt and the Nigerian economy and how that is sort of feeding or not feeding into our elections. So anybody interested in that conversation can actually watch because they also stream no matter where you are globally. All right. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get Azul's uh, perspective. And we'll, move. Uh, well, so thank you very much for that intervention. In fact, I, I remember that Chido, when you first sent out the invitation to me and I looked at the subject, I was wondering what needed saving, whether it was actually the media, because your subject is the role of the media in 2023 elections, and the media in crisis, saving the media in Nigeria. So the questions, I mean, I ask myself a lot of uh, questions. Is it the media that really, um, you know, that need, is it the media that needs saving? Is it the, uh, the election that needs saving? Like, or what exactly, you know, what exactly do we, you know, what, what exactly are we dealing with here? Um, I think just to play the devil advocate for a while, if I may, I sometimes worry that um, following the tradition of the agenda setting function of the media, uh, which goes back, as I'm sure that we all know, to 1968, when some studies were done based on the Carolina election, uh, there is the general conception that that is still up for debate about just how uh, far the salience of issues reflected in the media affect voter choices. Um, but to dive to the topic, I, I think it's also important to try and separate some of these things. There are issues related to elections, and there are issues also related to the media, in my view. Um, for example, if you, if, you, if you 
deal with the issues related to elections. We know that for the two, last two election cycles, the numbers that we have from INEX suggest that voter turnout um, has been around 35%. And that is for elections that are in season. The off-cycle election, the voter turnout is even far less than that. So that is not a media-related issue, but it's an issue related to the, um, to the election and to the political cycle, if, you, if I may. Then, of course, there is also, we have talked about the issue related to fake news, and my colleagues have spoken about that. Um, then, then the, of course, there's the issue of violence. These are not media-related issues as such. Um, misuse of security agencies and vote buying. Now, if you take that on one side, so those are a bulk of issues that are on one side. On the other side, if you then look at the media, and we do a bit of introspection. Uh, Simon has very eloquently mentioned the issue of ownership and how ownership priorities may affect, um, you know, our choices and, 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 and the sort of um, content that we respond to during media. There is also journalistic culture, which I think is a major media-related issue that we have to deal with. There is the issue of resources, and of course, there is the issue of onslaught of co-created content. So my point is that. Perhaps if we separate some of these things, that there are issues related to media and there are issues related to the way our elections are, uh, the way we, the situation that we currently find ourselves are uh, in, in respect to the elections. Now, so the question, uh, if I may just say a word or two before I hand over to Kadira or any of my other colleagues about, so what are you doing? I, I think that that really is the, the point here. So what are you doing? What is the media able to do to, to deal with some of these issues? whether there are issues directly uh, related to the media or there are issues that we find ourselves obliged to deal with on account of what the Constitution and what our profession uh, requires us to do. I, I think, in my view, one of the things that we need to do urgently uh, to regain the ground, uh, so to speak, as uh, Kaderia spoke to the, the, you know, the, the sleeping trust, will have, to do, will have to be expansion of our knowledge base. I think the media has to do a lot of work to expand its knowledge base. And I believe that we are doing quite a, a bit of work in that area in, in leadership, and I'm sure in, in a number of other media houses. I think secondly also, um, and I, I, I've done this a number of times in the past in my experience, and we are doing it again, and it's an experience that I'm more than happy to share with colleagues. Uh, when election is approaching, we set up guidelines. There are not guidelines outside what, the, the, what journalists are supposed to do, but because we are taking in younger and younger journalists who may be covering some of these issues for the first time. So we set up guidelines about what you are supposed to do and remind you of some of those things that you are supposed to do. Uh, I also think that journalists should not be shy to collaborate um, as we move closer and closer to election time. I think we should be able to use the FOI and uh, fact-checking websites more. Um, I think we need to let our platforms be more uh, inclusive, cover weak and vulnerable voices. And I think we also need to remind ourselves that we have a constitutional duty and a duty as professionals to hold, um, uh, to hold uh, people who offer themselves for public office accountable to people. Um, I'll just pause for now and maybe return to any of you. Okay. So let me, um, we touch on key issues, trust of the media. Uh, people seem to um, not trust the media a lot, not just in Nigeria, across the world. But, but and this season is the political season, and we know that there's a lot of money inside um, this season in terms of uh, people trying to change opinion and buy the media and buy uh, voters. Uh, we've seen people, politicians, giving out money to uh, to different um, delegates and giving out money uh, uh, to people. I want to know what. Uh, as leaders of the media, what you are doing to make sure uh, that it doesn't impact the reporting that you are receiving. Because as editors, you may not know what happened before the story gets to you. You you see the story and you decide whether to run or not. So what are what are the safeguards that are being put in place? Because people who are watching us, they may want to know because they think the assumption is that if politicians are sharing money, that they are giving it to media and that everybody is collecting money, that what they are reading, they can't trust it. That's what I hear from people. You know, you are being paid. You are being paid by this person or that person. How do you deal with that? How do we convince the the audience, our audience, our readers, 
because when we look at people here, we, over, we have over 200 years of experience in media, but um, people still don't trust us. They don't still believe what we're saying. Um, so, <laughs> I know we don't like to see, talk about age, but I know that if I add it up, if I add it up, it's over 200 years of experience. Um, <laughs> let me start with you. Uh, not uh, quite, but uh, uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Okay. So, so uh, not quite, but uh, over, so definitely over a century. Yes, definitely over a century. <laughs> We're sure. Uh, yes. So let's start with you, uh, uh, Kadero. Tell us um, what what you're doing in in the organization. You know, the people you you are your staff. How do you try to prepare them and make mm -hmm. sure that that if they are being induced, because you may not know yeah so i mean to be honest with you these are not just um issues that come up during elections um in 2019 um i sort of um, led a training program uh funded by the macarthur foundation um that put together editors actually from across uh, media newsrooms where we worked together with them and they actually came up with something called the election charter for Nigerian journalists. These were sort of editors of political desks of sort of various media houses, both broadcast and, and media. That charter is something that they developed for themselves and it's sitting on our website for those who are interested and they can sort of look at it. And it was a very practical way for us to sort of engage with the sort of, if you like, gatekeepers, um, because these are sort of line editors that then sort of are the first check for when people, reporters come back from the field with reports. And we sort of worked with them to try and understand how to ensure biases are detected and how they can be weeded out. But I think you'll find that generally process is really the way in which you deal with these things. Um, like you said, you're not going to be following, you know, reporters into the field and making sure that they're doing, but if you have an editorial policy and from that editorial policy, you've actually pulled out proper processes through which your, your, your news is treated. So it sort of goes through things like the verification that Simon was talking about, the authenticity, ensuring balance, ensuring that um, what you're reporting um, is, is, not, is, is, is not speculative, you know, all the things, and, and that you, you, you are fair to whoever is being covered. But more importantly, in the case of election, that you are not just focusing on covering the, the mainstream parties. And I think this is where perhaps, you know, you find that a lot of the Nigerian media sometimes fail. And it's not a, a deliberate failure. We, we, we get sucked in as well, because a lot of the drama tends to be with the leading parties, because they are sort of have the biggest contenders, they have the biggest noisemakers, you know, if you see what I mean. But they also have savvy politicians who are used to actively courting and understand the role the media plays. And so if care is not taken, what you end up with is a very skewed media space because a number of things happen. Um, they make the news, and so we sort of tend to want to cover it and we focus on them. In the case, in the case of Nigeria, it's almost always inevitable, either the ruling party, the APC, or the leading opposition party, the PDP. That is not us, you know, giving Nigerians a fair look at sort of all the parties that are, you know, um, contesting. But the second thing as well is actually these two parties also have a lot, a large chunk of media spend, meaning outside editorial coverage, they can also buy spaces through, you know, um, putting out advertising and all of that. And so what you end up with is a conversation that essentially dismisses other potential um, candidates that may have become real alternative for Nigerians, had Nigerians been sort of presented, if had they been presented to Nigerians. And so for us, part of what we've sort of done in our planning for elections is to deliberately seek out the smaller parties and tell our reporters that, you know, um, for every sort of one hour that you give to PDP and APC, you will also find equally the same hour to sort of give to the PIPs and, and, and things like that, even in your editorial coverage it's a bit harder to do with commercial coverage because at the end of the day media also needs to survive but at least if you try and do it editorially you might be able to sort of um deal with the the skewing of coverage where sort of smaller parties um are disadvantaged because of their um, um size and, and and lack of sort of 
if you like, character, you know, in, 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 on their platforms. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as a, I want you to look at the same issue, but also to give us an insight into, you know, the way we used to talk about the legacy by the press. Now the, the press in Abuja, and and how how is that impacting uh, the northern region in terms of the northern press and the voice of the northern press being being heard across across uh, the country? So so you can integrate that in your answer to to this question about. Um, about money and and uh, media. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think Kadore has main, mentioned a, a very important point about process. Um, but of course, process will almost naturally follow the rules. So the rules have to be clear, uh, and then you have the process, and then of course the monitoring of that particular uh, process for it all to add up to the result that we all aspire to get. So um, yes. Yeah, so why we have why we have rules in place and the need to update those rules and all of those things. It's also, uh, we, we have, it, it, the, the, the question is, is a bit more difficult to, uh, to deal with in, in, in the context of what is emerging called promotionals or co-created content. And by which I mean a situation where, and it doesn't have to be only at election time, but anybody who has content uh, that they want to... Uh, you know, share with the media, sort of agrees with uh, media managers to say, okay, look, instead of labeling this advertising outright or calling this promotional to put consumers on that, we want you to pass this off as, as news. Uh, and so that's not something that is starting during elections. It's something that predates elections, but which increasingly I, I, I find and I think would spread during election time. Uh, people insisting that this content that I'm publishing, okay, I'm going to pay for this. Uh, what in, in radio and TV in those days, they used to call commercial media. But increasingly, I think there's a situation um, outside the core broadcast, even in print and um, on, on, on the, on the, on, uh, on the uh, online platforms, where advertisers, because media's, uh, media uh, uh, you know, firms find themselves in a situation of having to do what they can to survive, sort of lower or lower the rules in order to accommodate this content, which ordinarily should not appear um, as, 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 uh, as content that, uh, that, that, that is non-need content. So I would say that there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, in, our, in leadership, for example, what we have tried to do is not only to make the rules clear, but also to make consequences clear and also to incentivize younger reporters and people who write exemplary stories also hold up such stories as examples of how others ought to do it. And that is working for You cannot guarantee that every content that you publish um, is 100% accurate or somebody has not been induced uh, to do something that is unethical. But once people in the system also know that there will be consequences when they find out, I think that that's a very uh, important form of control. Uh, now, to come back to the question of the... Um, Lagos, uh, what you call the Lagos Ibadan, uh, you know, uh, access divide. I, I, I do not think that during election time, um, that is so much of a main, main factor. I, I think that the sense that I get is that when you look at the media space today, there appears to be strong um, feeling of resentment towards the ruling party for whatever reason. And it does seem to me that across media, whether in the north or in the south, or in the west or in the east, that resentment is also manifesting itself in the content that we consume. Um, but it's now up to us as professionals, as Kadoria has said, to ensure that we allow sufficient voices, whether they are voices from the north or voices from the south or voices from the east or voices from the west, because we recognize as professionals that this is about the, the, the power of people of Nigerians to vote. This is about empowering weak voices wherever they may be. And there are voices that are deprived in the North as much as there are voices that are deprived in other parts of the country. So but when it comes to election time and the sense that I get from just looking uh, across the media space and looking at the content that is consumed is that the feeling appears more towards the need to galvanize people uh, to report things in such a way that Hopefully, that people will be able to hold office holders to account more than with the north-south divide that the 
normally deal with on, on, in normal times. Thank you. Uh, Simon, uh, while you approach this, I would like you to also um, give us an insight into the difference, you know, being that you are online now, uh, what are the advantages you have and how have you been able to utilize that to do something that traditional media, maybe because of the body that they carry in terms of being uh, having to produce a physical newspaper and that you have an advantage how have you utilized that to make um efficient the operation of of the cable yeah thank you very much for that in fact it's as if you knew uh the angle i was going to come from uh, for the traditional media uh our ancestors in this business uh, the print media <laughs> the radio <laughs> Uh, they are highly limited in terms of space. They're highly limited. They have 24 hours to program. For the newspaper, they have 64 pages. For us online, we're virtually unlimited. And that has made life easier for us. For instance, at the cable, there are reportorial standards, whether it is election or not election, there are reportorial standards about reflecting all sides to a story, about accuracy, about balance, about fact check. So sometimes you are writing a story, you have reported, you are unable to get the other side. Immediately the other side comes in, you report. This is not something that the typical newspaper can do. They have to wait 24 hours later to be able to report the other side If for the print newspaper. For the radio, they've already programmed, they have their programs lined up for 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is what is going to happen. So you can't cut in while they are running a TV, a radio commentary on the uh, not my on radio. Football match. <laughs> 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 you can't cut it. So we just got uh, the other side of the story. Maybe you have to wait until they say on your news uh, on the hour. Cycle. Now um that gives us a bit of an advantage. Now, how do we resolve the issue of media and money? We report all sides. Of course, we trust our reporters that they have integrity. I have never had anybody come to complain to me about any of my colleagues that they behaved in a way that is unprofessional or maybe chasing money or blackmail. I have not had that. And we, we clogged eight years yesterday. Not one person has ever told me. Of course, nobody can accuse me of blackmail. I don't engage in blackmail. Um, but that is beside the point. Now, the we have a standard all sides like look at this presidential election now you have only god knows how many now 30 people saying they want to be president of nigeria we give everybody anything you say i will find the news uh worthy we'll publish whether you are a, a, a you are in a party that can win a party that can win waziri adio wrote an article today where he classified them into pretenders contenders and spoilers we don't <laughs> care whether you're a spoiler, you say this will report. You are a contender, will report. So that takes care of any issue of bias. Because we have the space. If you look, pick a typical newspaper, the front page, how many stories can go there? How many people they don't go beyond the front page? But for us, you can have 1,000 stories on the home page. You just be scrolling as it. So that has also helped us, naturally helped us. To, to be able to go the extra mile in terms of reflecting in, in, in what uh, uh, all the contenders and pretenders and the spoilers are saying, and also being fair to all, because um, we it shouldn't be the battle of the fittest, that it's only the billionaires who have the power to to uh, the, that should be reported. Even the one that doesn't have a campaign office, we are going to report such a One thing that he's, he or she, she says, can be very important in the uh, 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 to, uh, in the process. And uh, also the issue of promoted content. We are very clear. If it is promoted content, if it is something you are paying for, we have to label it promoted content. We don't want to confuse our readers. We have to label it promoted content. Uh, but Mr. Shekwen has spoken about co-created content. It's a problem. It's really, really a problem. Because the reader should, be, should know that this thing we are reading is not purely from the cable there is also somebody uh call a uh, paint the piper and call it it so it's, <laughs> it's it's a bit of a, uh, of a of a problem for 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 the newspapers but at the cable we label them promoter content thank you simon um, uh, Mr. Fungo, could i 
could I add a little bit to what Simon said? I mean, I, mean, um, I, I agree with everything he said, but I just thought it was important to, to clarify a few little things. So obviously, um, he sort of reinforced this issue of inclusion that I talked about and the fact that, you know, we have to make an effort to sort of offer a platform to even the smaller parties. But, you know, I get very concerned um, when people start talking about journalism and, and hearing all sides, because there are times where our job is not to hear all sides. Our job is actually to find out what is going on and report it. So if, 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 if one side says it's raining outside and another one says actually the sun is shining, there are instances where you do a disservice to your listeners, if you report that one side says it's raining, the other side says it's sunny, um, it is your job in those instances to actually step outside and check and see whether it's raining or it's sunny. Um, and I just thought it was important, you know, to talk about that because um, part of, I think, the confusion that happens, particularly where money politics is a big thing, is you can actually get people helping without even us being aware. Um, helping to set our agenda for us. And we've all agreed that agenda setting is a very critical part of the job that we do. So I just wanted to sort of emphasize that. But we also have a blind spot when it comes to covering elections. Um, um, and, and that blind spot has to do with um, internal party democracy and primaries in the run-up to the elections. Part of the biggest tragedies in Nigeria is that Elections are actually the tail end of what is a democratic process. And often, at least in the last two, three election circles, part of the tragedy of Nigeria is that Nigerians, by the time we get to the ballot paper, are often faced with choices that are not particularly palatable. So they're being forced to choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. And I have been very frustrated at the fact that the media with some are doing it. I'm not saying everybody, because obviously, like Simon said, you can't talk about, you know, like the media in general. And so there are always exceptions. But, you know, we haven't sort of seen a concerted effort of Nigerian media to sort of actively take part in setting the agenda so that Nigerians begin to sort of force conversations that try and see if they can influence political parties so that at the very least you have a base quality of candidate and that, that way, if you end up with the ballot paper where A or B, it becomes even less important which party wins power because you kind of, as citizens, are assured that no matter who wins, there's a base quality for, for that candidate. But like Simon said, we, we are now, when we talk about party primaries and this run-up to these party primaries that will determine the party flag bearers and the names on the ticket, we are now stuck on a conversation around zoning, we're stuck on a conversation about uh, religion, ethnicity, whose turn it is, da, da 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 Almost as if you can't do that, and I understand why it is significant in a place like Nigeria, but there's nothing that says that quality should outweigh inclusion. You know what I mean? You, you should be able to have a degree of zoning that allows you to make everybody that is Nigerian feel that they are part of Nigeria while still insisting whatever zone it is, produces quality as well. And so I, I would like to see a little bit more engagement from Nigerian media on the process that sort of throws up our candidates. Because often by the time you get to the elections, it's too late. All right. Yeah. We are going to take a break, uh, a one minute break. But um, when we come back, we talk about experiences of uh, all of you, especially uh, people who have interviewed presidential candidates and um, and how that is playing out. Um, <laughs> but we're going to play a video. This is not paid for so we can make make sure that people <laughs> understand. This video is actually helping um, young journalists. I think it's an opportunity for them to um, maybe um, uh, get more knowledge. So we play that and then we come back. The media is a fourth estate, courageous members of the society. This all-important profession must always be upheld to the highest standards. Our opinions, perspectives, reports and comments hold the potential to shape public perception about any person, occurrence or issue. It is not a responsibility for the faint-hearted or the unprofessional. And often, it is a thankless job. MTN, Nigeria's biggest technology company, has chosen to support the ideals of media practice and strengthen the ranks in the rapidly changing media landscape. 
with the groundbreaking Media Innovation Program, MIP. The six-month certificate course in partnership with the Pan-Atlantic University and the University of Wittfeldstrand in South Africa. Where participants will receive the highest quality media and communication training. And it is open to midstream media practitioners across the entire spectrum including social media. Does media convergence excite you? Are you inspired by contemporary ideas and fresh perspectives? Then you should be a part of the media innovation program. And learn from the best. By the end of the program, fellows would have enhanced knowledge of emerging media trends and become part of an exclusive network of media professionals with access to world-class resources. To apply, Log on to www.smc.edu.ng forward slash MTNMIP. Click on the icon to apply and fill the application form. Applications open on April 27, 2022 and will close May 5, 2022. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, as as um, Simon, I saw you say that it's a thankless job. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Why have you been doing it for such a long time? Rudolph, sorry, can we, before we get to whether they, they are well paid or not, and I know some of them are well paid, <laughs> let, let me ask this question. Uh, congratulations, Simon, on eight years yeah. of the cable. You, you're doing yeah, a terrific you. job in terms of, yeah, thank you. I mean, we, we enjoy you and uh the work you and your team do uh Thank the question much. i want to ask is uh kaderia you talked about that simon about reflecting on sites and kaderia had a bit of a different perspective yeah. to it but she also raised a very important question about processes and i'm thinking in my head as if uh, you know we had some discussion before that i think before we started this program rudolph and i were talking about why for example uh the main, at least the main political parties are not going to have interviews for in the primaries. Yeah, like a debate. Like a debate before we now talk of the national debate and the parties that I tried, emerge. they refused. They refused, I yeah. Tried. We tried I to tried. get them. I actually tried. Good, I very good. I put forward a proposal to all of them that can I help you put together either a town hall or a debate so that your main candidate um, some day will answer me. <laughs> I'm happy they, I, I, because I thought we are because we are small people in the industry. No, no, we wanted to have a debate with their not even the candidates. If the candidates cannot come, their surrogates to come on this show and debate. No, they don't want to. They don't want anything on record. So, so two, uh, two I, quick questions. I, I I think that there is a. This is just my sense. Kaderia, well done for your effort. Um, <laughs> I'm better luck next time. But I just get a sense that the parties think that um, and it's not a matter of whether it's right or wrong. It's just the impression that I get from trying to engage a number of them. They think that whatever happens during the primaries is basically the party affair. You know, they, they don't think that they... they yeah, but the, 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 party, the party is made up of human beings, of Nigerians, yes. of, of voters. You, 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 think, you, you think so, Chido, but I, I think that they probably think, they probably think that they probably think different. They think that whatever happens in the party is basically party affair. Perfect. But the, I think a fundamental point that has to be made in dealing with that kind of perception is that we have also seen time and time again that when there are failures in the recruitment process, it ultimately affects the wider public because it also yes. uh, affects whether people are going to come out to vote, whether they have confidence in the system, whether they believe the system has been fair and or not. When you are presented with two incompetence, what exactly. do you do? So, so we're faced with a situation where, they, they, as, as things stand now, they do not seem to see a connection between what happens during the party primaries and the eventual outcome during elections. But we have said that if you look at the electoral the turnout, although you may also say that it's a worldwide thing, but if you look at the, the, the election turnout over the years, the figures are steadily declining, and it's worse for off-cycle elections. So it's something that needs to be dealt with. Okay, quickly, two questions before Rudolph uh, takes on his personal uh, money, money <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I want to find out, looking at the media landscape in Nigeria and talking about media in general, uh, do we think 
that the media is representative enough of Nigerians, that the media captures the views and voices or lack of it of Nigerians, because there are people who are commenting on these uh, comment sections here. Some of comments are quite uh, like harsh, so we may not pull them up, but people are wondering why certain things are not being reported and so on. And I'm sure we understand uh, the point I'm trying to make. That's on one hand. On the other hand, there is beyond politics, there is the existential crisis that our nation faces. And the media has been called out on it. And uh, uh, Kaderia was front and center on this sometime last year, and she received a lot of flag. Can we, ladies and gentlemen, speak to these two issues? Well, um, if I may, if I may go first, yes, uh, please, very, yes. very quickly. I, I I think that those concerns, um, which you know, go back fundamentally to the point about trust, which Kadore raised at the beginning. Um, you know, it's it's really a matter of trust. But I, I think that I do think quite seriously that uh, pluralism. You are talking about inclusiveness. Whether we think that there's enough inclusiveness in the media space to warrant the kind of confidence. But I think that pluralism is one great check on what we're doing. Uh, which means to say, I mean, uh, unlike what used to be in the past where we were, were restricted, I mean, consumers of media content were essentially restricted to just a number of traditional media houses. Today, for example, um, a combination of three influencers have far more followers than the entire, um, you know, galaxy of editors put together. I mean, if you look at... Um, Maybe they <laughs> three or three of them. I mean, three, three, three of them. Three of them. Uh, Funke Akindele, Yemi, um, Yemi, uh, Yemi. What's her name now? Um, Funke Akindele. Old man. There are three, three of them. Combined, have, they, they have three. Three of them combined have uh, an Instagram follower of forty-two point three million. Now I don't know of any galaxy of editors that 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 will have that kind of you know. But I think what is happening, and it's a good thing, uh, the media is far more pluralistic today, in my view, in terms of where you can engage and consume content than it used to be in the past, which is a good thing. I think the media is also learning a very harsh lesson that for you to continue relevant, for you to run a sustainable platform, you need to continue cultivating the trust and confidence of the people that you serve. Otherwise, sooner than later, you'll be out of business. So if, you, if, if a, a particular uh, news platform is not sufficiently reflecting the kind of content that you want to consume. There are multiple platforms elsewhere that, that from where you can get those contents. And I think that as long as we remain pluralistic um, and that pluralism is not hindered by any means, I think that, I, I think that the, the future is bright. But of course, I admit that there's a lot more that we can do uh, to, be more, uh, to be more inclusive and more responsive to what happens. Simon then uh, Kaderia. Yeah, um, I just want to quickly address the issue of uh, hearing all sides. I think uh, she misunderstood what I was saying. When I was talking about that, I was saying all the contenders and pretenders and uh, spoilers, anything they say, oh, uh, I'm the best candidate or whatever, whatever, the, whatever they say about themselves, of course, we have to report. We won't say, oh, this one has no chance of going. Don't let us report. If they collect forms, we report. Oh, this guy has gone to collect the form. We report all that. In terms of if people are making claims that have to do with facts and truth, of course, that's why we do fact check. So when you make this claim, this one make this claim, then we, we, we do our own research. Um, so we have no, we are on the same page as for that. Now, for the media, I I think we, I think some of these things are exaggerated, to be honest. There was a time in Nigeria we spoke about Lagos, Ibada Press. That kind of a an overwhelming market power in the media. But today, there's no part of Nigeria that is not adequately represented in the media. Whether you're talking of ethnicity, whether you're talking of uh, political persuasion, there are newspapers that are sympathetic to PDP, there are newspapers that are sympathetic to uh, APC, and there are newspapers that they report everybody. Now, what point am I trying to make with that? The era of a dominant uh, narration in the media is over. It's over. Even in 2015, that people I saw with people brought in Buhari. It was not every newspaper in the year that was supporting Buhari. There were newspapers that were not supporting him that were carrying some very terrible things 
you know, about him. So it's not as if the media sat down in a room and say, we want to be supporting this kind of, so all of us, let's be reporting only one side. It's not true. The, the plurality of the media, as uh, my boss has said already, is, has made this thing, the monopoly is gone. In fact, one of the things uh, Sahar reporters did to journalism in Nigeria is that things that will not be reported in the mainstream media, they started reporting, and this became a challenge because they were now leading to action, to remedy action by government, and so no need to, the media could no longer hide certain things. It went beyond them. And when we are even talking about social media, there are people on social media, I'm not even talking about influencers uh, and entertainers and all that. No, I'm talking about people who have knowledge, who have information, who are also using the social media to reach out to people. They understand balance, they understand accuracy, and they're also using the social media. So what I'm saying is that there is uh, the current system, nobody can't claim monopoly anymore. And that is good for the media. The plurality is, is good for the media. Mm. All right. Mm. Uh, Kadira, you want to say something? Or should we... Yeah. I'm, I, I, I kind of hear what both Simon and Azu are saying. And um, let me start first by addressing the issue of um, quality because I, and trust, because I thought Azu would actually reference it. So a few of us, almost five years now, have been arguing that we need some sort of system that um, helps us to regain trust, especially mainstream media of the, of the Nigerian public, and um, also improve quality. And we finally landed on sort of co-regulation. And Azu and myself are part of a committee that was um, put together. We are a committee of three um, to look at a, some sort of ombudsman system, which you know has now been endorsed by the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria, a few online you know, media owners like Simon, but also um, all broadcast media owners. So we are kind of in the process of um, putting together, we checking our essentially policies to sort of, and, and, and terms and all of that, and then rolling out an ombudsman system. Hopefully it will happen before the elections. As you are leading this thing, so I'm sure you would, whatever. And, and the hope is that um, co-regulation, because you're also going to have, um, as part of the ombudsman system, professionals, that are not journalists, sort of, that are part of this process that sort of aims to give the public um, visibility so that they can sort of make complaints about media so that people can, you know, deal with their complaints, etc. So the first thing this will do, obviously, we hope, is, is begin to regain trust. And, and the second thing is we hope it will improve standards because if you are holding people accountable, and what you hope is that because you're holding them accountable, they will continue improving their processes. So I'm ki kind of really hopeful about that. But I, I, I hear what both Simon and Azu are saying about plurality. And in, in, in many ways, because in Nigeria, we look at inclusion on the basis of tribe and language, we're often tempted to think that things are improving. But I've always argued, that tribe, language, and religion are distractions. And that actually, real Nigerians that we are failing is more a class issue. And it's about so that the poorest of the poor among us, I'm not quite sure that they are as represented in the media as we would like them to be. So I, I, I speak to the experience of the frustrations that led me in 2019 to take the placard and go and lie down in front of Asu, um, in, in front of the presidential villa. Because at that time, the people of Zanfara and what was happening to them was very much outside national consciousness. We were in the periphery of national consciousness. Nobody was even aware or reporting what was going on. And it was largely because the victims were majorly poor rural people who did not have a voice. Has it improved? Yes. And you see some of the work donors are doing. If you look at some of the media that they are funding in places like um, uh, the Northeast, in places where you know you are beginning to use T and um, radio, you are beginning to use blogs and all that to give visibility to victims of conflict, for example, we've seen an improvement. But I think we, again, we have a blind spot, the Nigerian media, because when we think of inclusion, inevitably, because of the politics of our of our country, because of the the way that you know we've allowed politicians to sort of shape our conversations and our narrative, we often think 
if tribe is represented, if region is represented, if the two major religions are represented, never mind that the uh, traditional worshippers also don't get a look, you know. But, you know, we kind of then give ourselves a pat on the back and think that we are doing well. When in reality, the people that we really should be servicing are the poorest of the poor, the people, the 70 million Nigerians who, according to the world poverty clock at the moment, are living in abject poverty. And the predictions are that by the end of the year, there are going to be 95 million of them. Those are the people, in my view, that the mainstream media in Nigeria continues to fail. And so I think we need to do better. All right. Um, we are going to take another break. Uh, when we come back, we talk about uh, the media, uh, who is actually a journalist, you know, because this is things are mixed up and people are confused uh, out there about what is going on. Uh, but we want to play a video for our viewers and for our panelists, too. This is a point where I the question about who is a journalist and how we trained as a journalist. I want people to ignore the former governor and the senator, Oji Zokalo, in the video, and pay attention to the to the journalists, the reaction of the reporter. And, and I want the panelists, when we come back, to tell us, uh, what do they feel? I felt so ashamed that I was a reporter after watching this. Let's, let's play. But they know he's a thief. Hmm. Hmm. So, so, let me ask you, where did you get the courage from? Because, you see... It's me... not courage. No, I say what other people fail to say. A lot of people will have been wasted. Where, where did you get courage to say the truth? I mean, I because mean, listen, I have overcome that. Okay. I, I have no fear of dying. I can die tomorrow, I can die today. Mm. So, all mm. those fears are out of me. Mm. I'm not even afraid of who will kill me and who will not kill me. Uh, who, who stopped it? <laughs> so, we're threatened. We could have used one governor to remove him. But, you mean, the, not impeachment. No, 2003 election. Oh, okay. Okay. was gone. Okay, was gone. Okay. Hey, because we learned that he knelt down and begged that people in his bed. He also knelt down and begged me. Where, sir? In my bedroom. He came to the governor's lodge in uh, 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 He came middle of the night. He came straight to my bedroom because he's commander in chief. As commander in chief, the ADCs and security men have no right. They just knock on my bedroom. I opened it. was him. He knelt down and begged me. And after that, he won. I went to greet him. He said, I will suffer throughout my life for what I made to him. So this is the kind of man you are talking about. But Pastor Joe is an animal. He's not supposed to be. He's supposed to be caged where he passes out in zoo. Sir, why is there no petition before the FCC? Who told you? There are so many petitions. Go and ask Magu. I'm not a friend of Magu. Go and ask Magu. Okay, I know. There are many petitions against Pastor Joe. 16 billion and all that money he stole. And money he gave to businessmen. Obasanjo is owner of so many companies you are seeing today in Nigeria. But why it look appears as if there's no activities around it, as if you know as people if... know they don't want to talk about it. Hmm. Hmm. This is why the US intelligence or the, the North American intelligence agencies don't record, not respect him. The European Union don't respect him. His power is only in the AU. Hmm. They don't respect him because they know he's a thief. So, so, let me ask you, where did you get the courage from? Because, you see, it's me... not courage. No, no. I say what other people fail to say. A lot of people will have been wasted. Where, where did you get All right. All right. <laughs> let's let's stop it there. I, I, I'm interested. I mean, I, I've interviewed people before, including uh, Audrey Zocalo. And, and um, as a reporter, when you encounter characters like this, let me just leave it. Just I want to hear from you guys. How do you, um, who is a journalist these days and how are they trained and how, what do you feel when you see a reporter reacting this way? If this guy is reporting for you and sent in this video or, a, you know, what do you, how do you react to that? Well, um, Rudolph, I, I, I dodge the temptation to <laughs> on the <drug. laughs> I used to be drawn into that. But to say that um, there, there's no doubt that, um, I mean, I, I was talking, you, you recall that the last time we were talking about, uh, you know, if we're influencers, like Simon made a very valid point that there are social media influencers who are also using social media for good. Uh, but I was talking about the combined influence of uh, Yemi, Aladi, Tiwa Savage, and Funke Akindeli, who have a combined uh, video. Uh, uh, you know, Instagram followership of 22 points and asking which kind of... So 
to your question about who is a journalist, um, I, I think that that's also part of the question that has um, that that has uh, drawn us into the social media the social media bill, which uh, Kaderia spoke so eloquently about, and the modest work that we're all trying to do because. There is this debate going on out there that, well, everybody, there's the assumption, you know, in, especially among politicians, that anybody who has a phone, who has a mobile phone or a smartphone or who has a conversation and therefore can publish, um, you know, such content is automatically a journalist. I, I, I do not, I do not, I do not subscribe to that. Um, you can do your work in whatever area that uh, that you feel obliged to do it without necessarily calling yourself a journalist. And except we begin to understand and make the distinction between those who do professional work and those who do not, then we would always be tempted to, to look at things uh, from that point of view. So my, my direct answer to um, your question about who is a journalist and who is not, I, I, I think that um, we sort of would agree. I would, I would look at the common grounds. People would agree that a journalist is somebody who would have a certain level of training. And by training, I do not believe that you have had to, you ought to have gone to obtain a, a degree in mass common journalism to qualify as a journalist. I obtained one, but it doesn't make me better than those who, who, who do not have degrees in journalism. So, but I believe that you need a certain minimum of training. I believe you need to subscribe to a code of ethics. Uh, those for me are two minimum conditions, you know, uh, for for you know for for the for the vocation, if you like, that we find ourselves in. And I think the more of us that give ourselves to more training and subscribe or hold those standards in a code of ethics, which we all subscribe to, then the, the more people we have at that level, perhaps the, the less of this kind of problem that we would have. But I, I think there's also one more thing that I'd like to point out before I turn it over to my colleagues. I, I think that the legal system, I'm not saying it's easier elsewhere, but I think the legal system is, is failing. It's compounding the misery of people who uh, ordinarily would challenge some of these things that, that are going on. So when people know that they can do things without consequences, or if you take forever, for example, for a law on, on libel or defamation, for the people who are libeling or defaming you to, or defaming you to be held to account, then this sort of uh, uh, situation that we are, we are talking about uh, would, would more easily occur. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like my other colleagues to also <laughs> turn it over to them at this point. But, okay, Simon, yeah. Simon, please. Yeah, he has defined how I would define a journalist. Um, there are two ways of training people, and, both, and they are not mutually exclusive. One, you can be trained in the classroom. Uh, two, you can be trained on the job. Some of the finest journalists we have in the world today, not just Nigeria, did not study mass communication. But they underwent a certain level of training. I have a degree in mass communication. I'm very happy with that because I decided from my secondary school day to be a journalist. So when I was filling my jam form, first choice, mass comm, second choice, mass comm, third choice, mass comm, I was very clear what I wanted to do. So I'm, I'm happy for that. So I underwent classroom training. But even with the classroom training, there's a practical experience I needed to, to gain. But what the classroom training gave me is for me to understand that there's a science behind journalism. It's not that you just have a phone or a pen, you just had a rumor somewhere and, and you jump to town. No, I did theories of communication. I did magazine editing and production. I did newspaper production. I, did, I took electives. In psychology, I took electives, electives in economics. I did law and ethics. We read law, uh, media law and ethics, dating back to colonial era, all the laws on sedition and defamation and all that. So I, I mean, I went through an academic process. Fine, then I graduated. I started working and people who had been in the profession 10 years, 20 years before me were taking me through the rudiments. So the notion, even this idea of Citizen journalism is an assault on journalism. That because you were somewhere, you just saw something happen, then you have become a citizen journalist. I is I believe is an aberration because you can see something and you will not be able to interpret it. I mean, I, I've read a lot of things. Recently, somebody put something that um, the the car park at uh, MM2, or that there was a crack on the wall, took the picture and put it on show me and said the place was about to collapse. 
as a journalist, I would talk to a structural engineer and say, what does, does this mean? And by the time the structural engineer has explained, it was not a crack. It was it's deliberately created there for whatever is I don't understand the science of it. I, I remember when I was sat to the editor of this day, there was this rumor that Jim Juku Emeka Duku was dead from somebody that should be a reliable source. You know what I did? I just picked my phone and called him. And he said, when he now picked, ah, and I didn't know what to say. I can't say, ah, uh, are you dead? I couldn't, <laughs> I'm not. I said, oh, I just said I should greet you, sir. He said, you just said you want to greet me. Simon, Marshe, your name is Wambi. Simon, don't worry, I'm still alive. Because apparently it was very rumor. <laughs> you spoke to me, clean, <laughs> clean your mind. He said, ah, now, what am I saying? How many people, you just have a Twitter handle, then you had people discuss somewhere and say, oh, Ujuku is dead. The next thing, it, it happens a lot. Just, the next thing, you just jump into it. Oh, people say, oh, well, Fashola is about to join the presidential race. You can call Fashola. That is the advantage generally has. Because you have a smartphone and you can just create a website, does not make you a journalist, that citizen journalist or, or non-citizen journalist, whatever you call yourself. So I think the training is important, whether it is in the classroom or on the job, and subscribing to a code of ethics, knowing that there are rules that guide the profession. It's not just an all commerce affair. Not, even if you are drive, if you are a conductor, there are still rules for the conductors, which is something that doesn't need much training. Even for barbers, they still have rules. There are things they will not do. So it's very important that we understand that whoever wants to call themselves a journalist must undergo some form of training and also subscribe to the code of ethics all right uh, uh kaderia before you take on that question i also because we're running out of time and we are going to invite our audience to participate maybe they have questions for for everybody here but let me ask you um to to combine it with your answer um I know you are, you are you're the owner of your own media and you've worked for other people and and i'm thinking you and simon um what did you learn from working for other people sometimes we blame the owners of all these traditional media for all the problems in the media what did you learn now that you are an owner what have you changed for people who are working for you so that they don't experience what you probably experienced in in when you are working for uh, owners of a nigerian media traditional media Okay, so let me just quickly say that I, I in terms of, I kind of agree with everything they said about the professionalism and the training that is required to do journalism properly. But you know, I have a slightly different take on who is a journalist. I think a journal, if you if you create content and your content is not designed to hold power accountable, it doesn't really matter how professionally you do your content, how many schools you go to, you're not a journalist. Our constitution, especially in Nigeria, and I, I think you'll find that probably in most democracies, protects the practice of journalism and is designed to basically say, this is the, that's the, there's a reason we're called the fourth estate. I was scrolling my phone to try and find the section because it escapes me, but section somehow I was, too, too, I was too interested in their conversation. I didn't pay attention, but that is the one thing that makes journalism distinct and different from any other form of content creation. Now, you can't hold power accountable properly, obviously, if you do not have the training, the ethics, and all the things that Simon talked about and understand the rules of the game because there's a degree of, um, um, of fairness that is required. You can't just make up stories about, because you want to hold power accountable, you just accuse people of things. And that's where the training comes in and the ethics come in and all of that. So for me, you know, the medium is now less important than actually the job that we do. So um, Simon might talk about um, you know, non-traditional media, whatever. But the cable is on spaces. It's a new form and is using it really effectively. The difference between the way the cable uses spaces, though, as a medium, is that they will bring that knowledge, that journalism, that expertise in making sure that the conversation is properly moderated as distinct and different from someone who hasn't gone through the training. So, so you know, um, I, I, I'm sort of flexible in terms of 
the mediums through which one can practice journalism. So it can be on social media, it can be online, it can be on radio, it can be on. I mean, our radio now, we are now doing cross platform programs. So our programs, when you see them, yes, you see radio now, but you know, we're on video, we have a YouTube channel. We're doing all sorts of things. We're doing podcasts and et cetera, et cetera. So, 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 so journalism is, the, is, is, is a group of people who come together, whose job is constitutionally protected. And that primary job is to hold power accountable, is to become a watchdog that ensures that the people who are either put in charge of the country or who are any position of authority do not abuse that authority. And they are central to a democracy. Okay, so for me, it's kind of simple and straightforward. On the issue of um, being a media owner, and I, I have a lot of sympathy now for media owners that I didn't have before, I have to confess, right? I'm very lucky, uh, most, the bulk of my journalism was in the UK, and it was with a public broadcaster like the BBC. Um, what was unique about it, and what I've had to learn since sort of leaving the BBC, is that the BBC didn't have if you like commercial pressures. So we never had to deal with the fact that we had no money you know, to pay salaries. We didn't take advertising because we were funded. Um, when I was with the World Service, money came from the foreign office to fund the World Service. When I was working within the sort of domestic service of the BBC, it was the license fee. So, so what that does is that it does, I mean, the BBC is a massive school. You sort of learn a lot. What it doesn't prepare you for is coming to run a business that then requires you, while you are doing the journalism, you go and find money to pay your staff and make sure, you know, that the drive for money does not sort of impact your editorial independence. And in a place like Nigeria, it's particularly hard. And you find that a lot of media houses, for them, the lines are blurred. Um, I find that these are things you learn from experience. Um, in terms of sort of the things um, that I am doing that... You know, I, it's hard because we're also in an industry where the skill set is really poor and the few that you do manage to sort of train up get stolen very quickly, either by tech companies, um, telecom companies. Everybody's now creating content because rather than doing straightforward advertising, they're deploying storytelling to, to promote their brands, that sort of thing. So the skills required are very similar. So tech companies will offer three, four times what you're paying. Uh, the same thing with telecoms. And then the international media, you know, the BBC, the Reuters, the AFPs, you kind of train your local journalists and then they, came and they come and give them a dollar. So one of the biggest challenges as a media owner is sort of finding and retaining talent and finding and then sort of balancing, you know, between um, looking for sort of money and trying to bring in content and then ensuring that that drive for money does not jeopardize your editorial independence, particularly in a country where corporates have also learned to sort of do a quid pro quo when it comes to advertising. So they kind of give you money and there's a silent understanding that that means you're not going to carry like <laughs> stories about them. Right? So it's a very, very um, delicate balancing act that I think people sort of is experience that will teach you a little bit of common sense and sort of, again, processes and guidelines that you put in place. In terms of just looking after staff, I've just kept it really basic. I, I feed my people because, you know, food is even becoming an issue in Nigeria. I make sure that at least <laughs> you come to work. Yeah, I make sure that at least you have one solid meal a day. And, you know, we pay for it. Um, we try not to put them too much in danger. So we are not yet quite big enough to afford cars. We're not yet eight years old, but, you know, we provide Ubers <laughs> for people who work late because Lagos is dangerous. <laughs> And um, um, we, 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 we sort of ensure that our health care, for example, is com comprehensive and we also provide mental health support because I think the nature of what we do is very, very um, stressful, and particularly for people that you put in danger who sort of do a bit of investigative work and all of that. So these are just sort of the little things that perhaps you may not necessarily find in every media house. And a few are to be found in other media houses from who, whom I borrowed some of these things, you know. Uh, Simon is always holding my hand, him and Azu, and advising me on sort of what to do and what not to do. But I'm still a novice. Maybe we should have this conversation again in three years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're really running yeah. out of time. Uh, yeah. Simon, quickly, a minute yeah. from Simon. 
Hey, I'm happy we are running out of time so that I don't talk too much before I get myself into trouble. Um, well, let me say something. I had 10 jobs. I worked in 10 different places before uh, I, I set up the cable. So uh, if I say something, I'm not being particular about any media house. I'm just talking generally. So one of the things I've learned I, that I would say is different now when I became a media owner is that I don't joke with salaries. We are eight, we were we clocked eight yesterday. The latest any the latest time we ever pay salary was 24th of the month. 24th of the month. That was the latest. Usually 23rd. So all these weekend things. Now, because I realize that even if your salary is 10 cobble and it is coming regularly, you can plan with it. We also don't joke with staff loans. Uh, it's not that the resources are there, but the little resources that are coming, we have, you know, people have been able to take loans to pay rents, to buy soft loans with uh, generous uh, moratorium, you know, okay, don't pay in the first three months. Now, um, we have life assurance for, group life assurance for the staff. We, we do a lot of things that I did not enjoy in my previous jobs, in most of my previous jobs. And what I've come to realize is that some of my colleagues are ready to put their lives on the line. Not because they have so much, but because they also think that we care so much about their welfare. So that is one major thing I would say I've learned. And I'm not going to say more than that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we, we let in our audience, so there are some of them, but I've been telling them to turn on their cameras if they want to participate. We let them ask questions. Um, Raf, Raf, uh, welcome to the show. Raf, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so I was you, watching on the TV, so oh, okay. switch yes. off. So I'm assuming you have questions or comments for our, our panelists, so you can you can ask them any questions. Yes, uh, I have my own question, but Dominic said he, he doesn't want to come on camera, so I should ask his question. So should I ask mine first, or should I ask Dominic's question? You, you can do both. Um, Dominic, make yeah. it snappy. We'll just have five minutes, please. So okay. Can, yeah. All right. So greetings, everybody. Um, okay. So for my... Okay, I think I'll go with my question, because Dominic's question is all over the place. So... Uh, <laughs> Being that I grew up in Nigeria before I left, and uh, I got to see a lot of the destruction of, well, most of the destruction of uh, the journalism field, which I read a lot as a kid growing up into my young adult years. Uh, how, what is the advice that you you guys would, would uh, give to people who struggle with the credibility of journalism, people who lose faith in nigerian journalism i believe you saw some of the comments and you see how people struggle because i don't believe that all nigerian journalists are bad or like there's no credibility amongst nigerian journalism but i know that it's a big struggle i know it's difficult i know it's not easy but i know that it's a tough thing to maintain credibility i lived in portacot i lived in ibadan i lived in benin city and I was aware of the military beating journalists. I, one of my uncle's neighbor, his, he, I've forgotten his name, but his head was shaved by the military in Portacourt. So I've seen all that stuff. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what advice or what, in your own words, what would you say to people who just have lost faith in Nigerian journalism? Okay. They are, I believe it's only about brown envelopes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have also joining us Declan. Let's just take the questions and then um, you guys can respond. Declan, welcome to the show. Declan, you have to turn on your your audio. Uh, yeah, I think you're you're muted. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Okay. Uh, so my question, my question is, I'd like a little bit uh, of response, I guess, to to uh, um, uh, Kadira's response around what what constitutes a journalist. Um, especially in this kind of day and age when it seems like there's a lot of bloggers or really interesting folks who are using Twitter as a social medium to kind of report on facts. Do they qualify as a journalist? And, and then what's the line between that and citizen reporters? Um, all right. Um, so just before you rest, anybody responds to Declan, it, it should, <laughs> some of you may not know, he was a former editor at Sahara Reporters. So he's now in, 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 um, in Nairobi, Kenya. So, all right. 
So anybody uh, can take, take wait, on those wait, questions. Sorry, before we do, and this will be rounding up, so if you can give us your sound bites, uh, in, re in addition to responding to this question, starting from Azu, uh, as part of the topic for today, we mentioned saving the media. Mm -hmm. Looking at the onslaught of social media and the question of citizen journalism or citizen journalist who is a journalist, how do we save the media in Nigeria if you believe the media is worth saving in terms of regulation and other the economic constraints and so on? You can add that quickly, one minute each, please. Well, well, thank, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for that, and also give thanks to all those who have been today. Uh, we hope we can continue this conversation after. But I'd just like to read something very quickly uh, from a book by a guy called David Rondo uh, in, in, in a book called The Universal Journalist. He says, and I quote, even bad newspapers do more good than harm, something you cannot say for bad governments. Um, so, but to come, to, to come quickly to your point about, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what we can do, I do think that we have the opportunity as, as journalists, we have the opportunity once again, and Kadera was referring to section 22 of the constitution, I believe, to hold government accountable to the people. And it is not, our job is not defined by platforms, uh, which responds to the question that Declan made. It's, it's not a matter of which platform you are on, whether you are, uh, you, are, you are using a social media handle, whether you're working for a newspaper or a broadcast. It's actually the, con it is what we provide, the service that we provide that I think is, is essentially important and what we must do our best to keep improving on um, as, as, as we go towards the elections. Um, and I, I think that as for the matter of hope and what, what we can do to regain trust, Kaderia spoke to it earlier. Uh, we, we hope before the elections to announce the co-regulated, uh, uh, to announce a system which we hope will inspire trust to get people to, um, to, to, be able to complain about content in the media that they have issues with. And we're starting not just, we're not waiting for that to happen. We're starting even on a regional or zonal basis. So we have a situation where hopefully um, those in different parts of the country can align and work with the ombudsman in the existing institutions before the industry-wide effort is formally announced. Thank you. Yeah, uh, on my own part, two things. If you want to be a journalist, please don't be discouraged. Tell yourself you want to come and make a difference. These guys are not doing the right thing. I want to come and be different and do things the right way. It is very, very important. Um, how do we put the media in check? How do we watch them? I mean, we are the watchdog. How can we watch the watchdog so that I can do better? The people should never give up. Uh, I'm not very active on social media, but every comment on social media, our team does not joke with it. So we see how we can improve. Oh, you didn't include this. Oh, I mean, even as little as graphic, all your graphics, all men, there's no single woman there. Immediately the comment came, it was part of the graphics department. Henceforth, you must reflect gender, uh, plurality, or whatever they call it, in, the, in, the, in your designs. So the feedback from the public is very important in holding the media responsible, in addition to the uh, code of conduct that uh, we, are, we are talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Kaderia, maybe she's, uh, she said uh, uh, she said her system, know. yes. Okay. All right, I think this has been a very engaging uh, conversation and we hope in the days and months ahead as the country prepares for the next election that would uh, bring you guys back to to join us to continue the conversation thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, please follow us on our social media platforms 90 minutes africa on facebook youtube instagram and twitter and uh, you can also okay she's back you can also so send us I have power issues I keep moving from nice. one device to the other, uh, trying to sort of beat the sort of. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. No problem. So you're good to have you. 
No, no, yeah. we're just rounding up. I, you heard the questions. I don't know if you have any. No, I missed most of them, I'm afraid. I did. Oh, uh, okay. But so mm. maybe you. Just but I'm sure told... Simon and Azu have done. They've, they've done. Injustice they've to done to yeah, they've done justice yeah. to it. So I was just wrapping up and saying uh, this is an interesting period for our country. We look forward to continuing this conversation and we want to thank, thank you all you. for being part of this and hope that you oblige us when next week we we'll call upon you. Thank you so much and see you all next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I really we appreciate all your contributions today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Bye. 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 All right.